Hi guys and welcome back to this series on the OWASP top 10 for 2017 and at number five we have a new entry which was actually created from two separate uh, entries or two previously separate entries which were insecure direct object references and missing function level access control. The reason the two were merged is that the two are very, very similar. The outcomes are similar and the controls that you use to protect from those two vulnerabilities are the same. So they've been merged in the 2017 list into A5 and summarized as broken access control. Now, as we're going down the list, we can see these numbers are kind of reducing a bit. So in terms of how exploitable and how common, how detectable this is, we're looking at something that's slightly less serious. It certainly can be quite tricky to detect, certainly automatically. This tends to be a kind of a manual only approach to actually finding out whether applications are vulnerable. But as with many of these in the top 10, the technical impact of bypassing these controls could be pretty much uh, as serious as anything else because if you can bypass access access control you can probably read any data that the system contains even potentially system information that an administrator of the site might be able to read is all going to be visible as well so we're talking about something that's pretty serious even though it's not necessarily easy to detect so in terms of what we're talking about here with broken access control, quite simply, we're saying that the protection of data or functionality from unauthorized access is either missing or incorrectly set up. So either set up wrong or maybe only set only partially set up. So perhaps it only catches some attack vectors and not others. But where the protection of data or functionality from unauthorized access is broken that's really what this whole video is talking about and there's a couple of different ways this happens so one of them is assuming that permission is implied with the visibility of a link a menu page an item and we'll see that in a second on the code examples but we might think well if somebody can't see a link then that link is safe because how are they going to be able to click on it click on it or post to it if they can't see it but hopefully you realize that that is a, a weak argument because as soon as an attacker knows a page is there and there are various ways that they could do that then that page is open for attack if it doesn't have any further controls on the person's ability or permission to carry out that action the other way this is quite common is that where people have a single point of protection so they might kind of say well I'm going to stop them coming into this menu uh, and therefore you open them up to attack where somebody say well I don't need to go into a menu in order to take an action that's maybe usually listed on that page I can bypass the menu completely and just attack attack that endpoint directly and again we'll see an example of that in a second so where we're only putting in kind of maybe individual checks rather than having a much more comprehensive protection or set of controls then we're also potentially vulnerable to it and this is not quite true i've kind of put not using cause protection i mean cause is not actually a protection it's actually a reduction of protection and we'll have a, a quick look at that at the end because it is mentioned in the, the top 10 entry for a5 but really what we're kind of saying here is you need to set up cause protection correctly and not just open up api endpoints willy-nilly but that will kind of depend a little bit on what your application is doing and what your API is doing as to whether that's appropriate or not. So in terms of the how common this is, this is one of those issues that's probably fairly common, but because it's quite hard to detect, it can be quite hard to know quite how common it, it is. So the problem with automatable testing is that it's very easy to do if you're using patterns or you're using consistent requests from a tool in order to actually poke a system to find these things. But there are so many variables involved that this can be quite difficult to automate. So variables include values of session, 
We're talking about whether a user is authenticated or not. We're talking about all of the potential variables in a query string. Uh, by the time you multiply all of those together, you're talking about so many different potential attack vectors, so many different ways that you would need to try to break the system that the automated part can be quite difficult. And in terms of the general problems with the OWASP top 10, we come back to, again, this issue that development teams don't always include functional testing. So there are many teams that don't seem to have very kind of very consistent security process anyway but where where they maybe do have a requirement to use a certain control they don't necessarily test it very consistently or very comprehensively so again that can leave you vulnerable to to unknowns and to maybe more subtle attacks and just in general, lacking a consistent approach to access control. And I've worked for you know, several organizations in terms of writing web applications. And in most cases, the security is barely on the radar to begin with. But in terms of making sure it's done consistently, then you know that can be off the cards as well. So you might say, well, these functions in this controller were written really well and they have loads of security controls. But then in his other controller, maybe it was written five years earlier. Maybe it's written by a different person. Then, And that might lack all of the controls that are actually going to make it secure. So the lack of the consistency also means this is likely to be fairly common and suggests that probably most applications have at least a couple of these vulnerabilities. In some cases, many. And the famous example was uh, Hotel Hippo who didn't have any protection against this so where people could come into a page to look at their hotel booking and the little id that was in the url could be changed to any other id and that person could effectively look at anybody else's hotel booking and the thing that's scary about that is not just that the company ended up closing the site as a result, they decided it was too difficult or expensive to fix it. And obviously it needed to be fixed urgently. They just decided to close up shop. But the other thing is that that was a fairly well-known, fairly high capacity site. And somehow this massive error was able to go into production. So it's pretty scary and it does happen. But I just want to show you some examples of it which are fairly straightforward, which hopefully will help you to understand the kind of things that are going on. So I'm going to go back to my trusty kind of bank account example application. And what I've done in here is I've added some menu items. So this is Microsoft.net. Don't worry too much about that. But effectively, we have a menu in here built up from loads of list items. And in this case, I've added a private page. And it's called private page, just so it's obvious what's going on. And notice that this is inside a piece of logic that says the user has to be signed in in order to see that menu item. But in addition to that, they have to be in the role admin in order to see the admin page menu item. And this is a little bit of a hack. Don't worry too much about what's happening here. But basically, it saves me having to query a database. I'm kind of saying if I'm Luke at example .com, then the ID number for my account is one, whereas if I'm anybody else, the ID for my account is two. So that's just a little hack there. But as you can see, this is what most people do as a, a kind of a default level of security in terms of access control and authorization. And if I run this site up, it's just running locally on my machine. Then what we'll see is I'm logged in at the moment and I can see a private page and I can see my account. If I log out, we can see um, I can't see the private page. I can't see my account, but obviously the pages are still there. So the first up one I want to look at is I want to look at the indirect, uh, sorry, the insecure direct object reference. So if I log in and if I look at the URL for this, so let's just copy link. Uh, where do we copy link location? Just before I click on it, let's actually see what's involved here. Of course, that's on my other screen. So let's put it here. Right. So we can see here that we have the URL, which is the host part. And then in my case, I have the controller name, which is home, the action name, which is account, 
and then a parameter which is the ID and which is one. Now I've kind of designed this so that one is the correct uh, is the correct link, and if I go to it, it's telling me this is the account page for Luke Briner. Now, although this doesn't really look like it, what's actually happening here is this is um, a bit like this, and I think that will even work. Yep. Yeah. So that's actually a parameter, that, uh, and it's called ID, as it happens. And that lets me go into the account page for Luke Briner. And the problem on Hotel Hippo, the problem with the uh, object reference, is that if I go in here and I change this to two, it's let me get into somebody else's account page. And the reason is the only protection that this currently has is the idea that if I put the correct link there, the user is going to click on the correct link. And obviously an attacker is not going to think like that. And remember, an attacker isn't necessarily a criminal. They might just be a, an inquisitive person, one of your normal customers, you might go, oh, I wonder what happens if I change that. And by finding that out, they go to the newspaper. Everyone finds out that your site is trash and you go bust or you get fined or, or whatever happens. So that is what used to be called an insecure direct object reference. So that's the first example. The second example is authenticated users only. So if we pop back to our account and we log out. Now, remember I said that we had a private page and that private page is not visible at the moment, but I, which kind of implies at the minute that I'm not authenticated. But if I happen to know that there is a private page here, and of course it could have anything on there, if I don't have any function level access control, which was the other item that was merged into the new A5, then I can get directly to the page. Just because I don't have the link is not actually stopping me doing anything. I type it in directly and this is telling me, well, this should be a private logged in page. So that's another example of, you know, something very silly, something very easy to fix, but something that's all too common, hiding links behind menus and expecting an attacker not to use them. And a kind of an extended version of this is if I log in here and I put my password. Notice here that I have private page and that's fine because I'm logged in, so that should be working. But as you remember, I showed you on here, I also have another hidden link that says, well, actually, this is only for admin. And only if you're in admin will I show you the admin page. And as you might expect, I've done exactly the same thing by not securing that page individually. And if I go here, then I can also get into a page. So I, I am logged in, but this is another level of permission, which I haven't considered. So in most applications, it isn't just a case of anonymous user, authenticated user, but it could not just be admin, we could have uh, a backup user, we could have a help desk operator, we could have a help desk supervisor, we could have all these different roles which should or shouldn't be allowed access to certain pages. And because all I've done at the moment is hidden it, then I've kind of got a problem. So that's one of them. And the last one I want to look at is this idea of checking verbs. So if we look at this page, I've been able to do the get but what about if I submit the query? So even though I'd kind of hidden this top page, really that should be protected. But also the actual post action wasn't protected. So it's told me that that form's been posted. And in this example, it just goes back to the same page again, telling me that I've posted the form. So that's showing me that not just the get is a problem, but also the post is a problem. And we'll see the code involved in these things as we go through the next section of the video, which is really about how to fix it. And the first of these is making sure that you have a set of standard controls available to your development team. And in most good frameworks, or I would perhaps suggest in all good frameworks, there should be a set of standard authorization type controls, role based person-based, ID-based, depending on what exactly your site is doing, you should have a set of standard controls available. We will see what they look like in a moment in .NET. 
And you need to make sure that you're using checklists and code reviews to make sure that they're being used. So it's all very well having the controls, but if people are forgetting to add them, which people do because people are forgetful, then you need to make sure that there is, if you can statically analyze it, if you can use, you know, lint, linting tools, resharpering.net, all of those kinds of things to say every action on every controller must have an authorized type attribute on it, then you can make sure that things are not getting through by accident. And so let's have a look at those in code. Let's stop that a second. In terms of .NET, I only have a single controller in this in this application, and they have something very simple, which is the authorized attribute. So all I have to do here, let's look at the private page, is oops, sorry, just add that in. So all I have to do is set authorize, and that will require very simply that the user to this action is logged in. It's not specifying who they are or what roles they have. It's just saying they must be logged in. So if I'm logged in, which I am at the moment, and I click my private page, then this is working okay. But if I log out now and I try and get back into home private, what this is actually doing is making me log in. Now, there's, there's nothing I can do about that to bypass it because it's automatically redirected. So if I go back and say, no, no, I wanted to go to that, it's just going to keep redirecting me and making me log in. And only if I log in will it then say, OK, you can get into the private page. So as you can see, a very, very simple way of restricting an action to people that are logged in only. So that's pretty sweet. What happens then where I've got my, say, my private page? Well, in the private page, I can go one step further and say that, well, as well as being authorized, you actually need to be in the admin role to access this page. So if I run that again, my user, example.com is not in the admin group, the admin role. So my private page still works, but if I try to go to private two by bypassing the menu, as I did before, notice something different happens. Because I'm already logged in, the authorized attribute is basically going to say, well, you're already logged in, so you're already authorized, but actually you're not in the role. So this time you're going to get a 401, you're going to get an access denied and tells you, in this case, the default message is you do not have access to this resource. So with a couple of very simple attributes, uh, I'm basically protecting myself uh, from people who shouldn't be in these pages being in these pages. Now, that's all very well. But if we look back here at the index, part of the problem we have is that I've forgotten to put an attribute on index. And that might be because I've forgotten or it might be because I've uh you know, I should. it's a public action and everybody should be allowed to access it. But the problem is at the moment, I can't tell that just by looking at the code. So I kind of want a better way to actually enforce that we, um, we use attributes everywhere. And this kind of comes back to the next item, which is saying, well, if we use some kind of public marker, and again, this example is just .NET, so you need to find out what it's like in your framework. But in this example, we can do something to very clearly indicate intention on top of denying access by default application wide. So what I can do here is I can say, well, you need to be authorized for everything in this controller. I could apply this at application level if I wanted to, but in this case, I only have a single controller. But of course, if I do that now, I won't even be allowed to get onto the index page. If I run this and go to the home page, home, look, it's going to make me log in because it knows that I need to be authorized. And that might be what I want, which is fine. But in this case, it isn't actually what I want. I want the uh, front page to be accessible to everybody. So by setting that at the controller level and then overriding it at action level, hopefully, if I've done this correctly, which I think I have, then it should let me go to the home page without needing to be authorized. So effectively, by setting that at a lower level, 
it's overriding what I've set at the upper level. But the important thing here is that every action now needs to have an attribute. Otherwise, the user is not going to be able to access it. And of course, I could actually set that to be very strict. I could say only admin can access everything by default. And only if I override it with something less restrictive does the person get in. So that's quite a cool way of um, of setting up these things. The next one we need to look at is um, authorizing both the verbs for a getter and a poster pair. So again, this is .NET. This is a fairly standard pattern. You have HTTP get just to get the first page. So let's go to uh, let's run this up. Go to our site. And in this example, uh, if we go to, I need to actually take off. Um, well, no, let's go to home private two, and it will rightly say that I need to log in. Uh, and if I need to log in, uh, once I've done that, it's not going to let me in here. So I think, oh great, I've I fixed, I fixed it, I've done it okay. But of course, an attacker could still craft a post request to my site and was in this case still be able to post to it because i haven't put my authorize uh, onto private to and to rec and specifically to lock it down to admin only so again because i've now got this consistency because i've now turned off the controller by default and uh, because i can say every single action needs to have an authorized attribute on it it's just a very straightforward way in this example of achieving what I need to achieve. And although that kind of alludes a little bit at role based access control, the problem here is this is only really at action level. So at the moment, my code is kind of saying this action can be tied directly to a specific role. And this action is tied to any um, logged in, any authenticated user. So what happens with my account issue here? So if I go back to my application and if I log in, which I already am, if I go to my account, I've got my account here. Now, what's important to note here is that I do have permission to access this page. But the implication is everybody has a my account page. But the point here is I should only be able to access my own version of it and not, in this case, John Smith's version of it. Now, using the .NET built-in authorization controls as they are, that doesn't actually work because all this really allows is to specify the roles that allow you into this action. So I can't use this attribute. And in your framework, there might be a couple of different ways to do this. So I know that in the E2 framework, they have the ability to do um, something like um, context, uh, context dot user dot. And in Yi, they can say, um, I think it's called can, like user dot can edit own account. And then that will map onto a particular type of rule. But at the moment, we don't really have that. We This is a, a fairly generic web user. So it has the concept of an identity, has a concept of claims, but doesn't really have a very easy way to ask, you know, is this user, the current user, allowed to access this ID? Now, again, this is a little bit of a hack because obviously in reality, you'd want to do something much more generic than this. You'd want any user and any account to be queried to find out whether they have permission. But in this example, I've just done a little clunky one to kind of say, well, really, if, they, if they're requesting ID number one, then they want the model that's Luke. And if they're requesting ID two, they want the model name that's John Smith. So that normally would just come from a database automatically. But the question is, how do I restrict this at an object level? Because so far, I've been able to restrict things at an action level, but that's not going to work here. And in .NET, we have a new concept in .NET Core called a policy. So rather than just having a role, 
we can actually have a policy and this policy can be lots of different things it can be whatever you like it could be is the current user over 18 it could be is the current user from america or from europe or whatever you want to do in this case i've created a policy it's pretty dirty and quick just to basically say well let's get the id from the request and let's say that only if the id is one and the user is lucaexample.com is this authorization allowed to succeed otherwise it won't and again that is not scalable so please don't use that as an example but it's really just to show you that there is a mechanism in .NET and there are mechanisms in other frameworks to ask questions at a much lower level a much more detailed level than just using something like this so now that I've added that in here let me run my application again and this time we go to my account that's going to work because it says account page for luke briner but now because it's going to try and run this policy this policy is going to fail and effectively say well you don't have access to two you only have access to one and all of that is done in code it could be done at database level the ye stuff can be done either in code or it can be done as a database rule which needs to be created via an admin interface obviously things like ruby and python and all the rest of them are going to have their own mechanisms so the takeaway is not this is how you do it in .NET. the takeaway is you can restrict people at application level at controller level at action level or even at a more detailed level in this case by using a policy but in some cases you can just use a rule uh, it could be just inline code it might just say if user can access model then return it otherwise return a 401 so we can see here hopefully these are fairly easy things to fix but there are a couple of other things that are worth looking at uh, is logging is kind of one of those underrated mechanisms and we need to do logging well but the significance here is that we want to use logging to detect these type of attacks being attempted because that's how we learn from them and I'm not sure about you, but I've been in plenty of uh, situations where I've seen an attack, seen how somebody's done it, kind of gone through the logs and then gone, oh, wow, I never would have thought of that attack. And I never would have defended against it because I wouldn't have thought to do it. But by looking at the way the attack was carried out, I can put in some kind of barrier to actually make this either much harder or potentially impossible. And one of the ways to do that, for example, is to use rate limiting on websites and I showed that in the last video it's fairly easy to set up in most frameworks certainly in .NET it's very easy to do we say well if somebody can't just sit there trying millions of combinations then they're going to give up very quickly so rate limiting is, is a very useful tool got to be a bit careful because you don't want your real users to be blocked because that's going to start annoying people but very simple control and the other one that particularly applies to APIs, but it applies generally as well, is if you're using any form of access token, yeah, you should give your end users the ability to log out. You should give applications the ability to log out from an API and you should invalidate the access tokens once they uh, once they have logged out just to give it less, you know, less attack service, less ability for somebody to carry on attacking your application after it should have been logged out so they're kind of a number of ways to fix it like i say fairly easy to fix but i just wanted to mention cause briefly because cause is is related to cross origin resource sharing and cross origin resource sharing is saying well a browser is going to not let you do certain things across origins in other words a different protocol http https different host uh, different port numbers all of those are considered a different origin and things particularly ajax requests but also uh, web fonts and also uh, something else which I can't remember the browser would just say no you're not allowed to do that by default the problem is cause is slightly complex and if you try and learn about it you will find a lot of places that don't seem to understand what cause is doing and that's why it can be very hard to understand what the same origin policy is that is actually the security mechanism but also the way in which cause allows you to reduce the same origin policy restrictions in order to get your sites to work and what cause is basically doing is marking a resource as permitted 
from other specified origins. So if you had an API, you could say, well, my API is allowed to be accessed from front end dot, you know, my website dot com because my API might be on API dot my site dot com. And by allowing the browser to break the same origin policy, you allow that site to work, even though you want to be using different URLs. Like I say, the problem is, is it only applies to certain requests. So what's called a simple request isn't um, restricted at all in cores. And also it's only enforced in browsers. So it's not going to stop an attacker coming to your API and getting information. What it is going to stop in most cases is an attacker pulling your information directly into their website. So imagine a news website that it's stealing news feeds from other people and putting them in its website in order to attract users. So it's that kind of thing it does protect. So it doesn't actually prevent direct attacks. It doesn't prevent a lot of attacks. It doesn't even prevent people sending post requests to your website. It only prevents, the browser only prevents people reading the response of that to know that it succeeded. So it's a very, very, the same origin policy is very limited. Cause enables you to reduce that even further. And that's why A5 mentions minimizing cause usage. Cause isn't really a security um, control. It is a security bypass. And because it only allows certain functionality and doesn't completely protect anything, A5 is suggesting that we try not to think of cause or the um, same origin policy as a security mechanism, but use pr uh, proper correct authorization controls like the ones we've seen to actually gain better protection for your API. So using access tokens, correctly time limiting those, invalidating them after lockout, after logout, and just using role based access, all those sorts of things we've already looked at. That's the correct way to protect APIs and to protect systems, not using same origin policy and some kind of uh, cause mechanism to make that work for your application. So that's all we've got for this one. Please read the top 10 publication. It's got more data than I can contain in the video. It's got all the links to all the cheat sheets, the application verification standards, the proactive controls from OWASP. So there's a whole load of stuff there. But hopefully I'll be able to get the next video out over the next few days and keep going until I finish all 10 of these. So we'll see you in the next video.